This is Known Podcast, hosted by Dustin Bennett, the lead pastor of Known Victory Church in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Known Podcast is dedicated to helping you grow closer to Jesus, unleashing the power of your creativity, and developing you as a leader. We hope you enjoy today's episode. All right, well, welcome back to the Known Podcast. So excited that you're joining us today for another episode. It's an honor to have you listen to what to what's happening you know, in, in our podcast. And I think all of us as leaders, as humans, as pastors, as parents, we want, we, we're asking this question. And the question is, what do I want to be remembered for, right? When we get to the end of our life, when we get to our funeral, when we get to our tombstone, what is it that we want to be written on there? I think this is something we really do think about, something that we really do care about. And we all want to be remembered for the, for the accomplishments we have, right? We all want to be remembered for the success that we have. We want to be remembered for the, for the businesses and the wealth that we built, right? We want to be remembered for what we accomplished, but we also want to be remembered by our significance. How did people feel when we were in the room with them? How did we treat other people? people how, how what is the significance that we want to be remembered for maybe the lives that we touched or how generous we were or how giving and how loving and caring we were we all want to be remembered and the truth is this is that you will be remembered for what you are known for right now you will be remembered by how you treat people right now you will be remembered by the success that you have right now by the significance that you have right now that's how we will be remembered so we need to reflect and think okay you know i want to be remembered for good things i, I hope it's the same for you what i want to be remembered for how great of a pastor and father and husband i well, that's how i want to be remembered but i have to really look and say okay that's how i want to be remembered but what am I known for right now, right? How do my kids feel when I'm in the room? Do they see me as loving and caring and present? Or do my kids view me as angry and aggressive and distant, right? These are the questions and the revelations or the realizations that we need to have is, okay, if I want to be remembered for something great, I better be doing something great right now. If I want to be remembered for being loving, then right now is the time to be loving because what we are known for right now is what we will be remembered for at the end of our life. What do you want to be known for? And this word legacy constantly comes to my mind, right? It's something that I always think about. You know, what will my legacy be? What legacy will I leave? Will my legacy die with me or will it carry on long after I pass away? What is the legacy that I am building here on this planet? What is it that I'm doing that's going to just change people's lives? Like, what is the legacy that I am leaving? What is the legacy that you are leaving? And there's incredible things. There's so many things that help us build great legacy, right? Like faithfulness and creativity and leadership and love, like so many things. But today, I want to focus on two different things, kind of the opposite. And what I want to talk about today is legacy killers, right? What are the things that we do, what are the things in our lives that actually destroy our legacy? What are the things that we do that actually get us to the end of our life when we're remembered for all the wrong things, right? We're remembered for all the things that we don't want to be remembered for. What are some legacy killers? Now, I'm just going to go through two today. There's so many more, but we're going to go through two things that will destroy your legacy. And number one is this, is uncontrolled anger. Uncontrolled anger. Under, uncontrolled anger will kill any legacy, right? It will destroy any legacy. And the interesting thing is that anger is not wrong, right? Because anger is actually an incredible motivator, right? It can motivate us to make a difference. It can motivate us to get up off the couch and, and go to bat for people or to be generous, right? It can motivate us to, to stand up for to injustice and fight for what we believe in, right? Anger can motivate us in real and passionate ways, right? Anger is a motivator. But oftentimes, because reality is this, is that oftentimes what makes us the most angry is what our legacy will be built on, right? So what makes you angry actually helps you determine, okay, what's maybe my calling or what's my purpose? The things that make you the most angry is often what our legacy is built on. And one, one way to realize your purpose, right, one way to realize your calling here on earth is to determine what makes your life, what, what makes you the most angry and then spend your life loving and serving in that area, loving and serving those people, or creating programs to be able to help those people, whatever it is, right? What makes you the most angry in this world? And for me, there's so many things 
that make me angry. Right? Let's be honest. There's so many things in our world that make me angry, and I'm sure it is the same for you. Do you know what makes me the most angry, though? It's pain and suffering. It breaks my heart when I see people, humanity, you know, God's children suffering with injustice or suffering with, with pushback or suffering from hunger. Right? That's what breaks my heart the most. When, when other human beings, when other people mistreat each other, you know, I have a heart for justice. I have a heart for justice. I have a heart for seeing the marginalized find freedom and peace because that's what makes me angry. And so what my response has to be, okay, this makes me angry. What am I going to do about it, right? What is going to do about the things that make you the most angry? And this very famous man, his name was William Wilberforce. Maybe you've, you've heard of William Wilberforce, but he was a huge influential leader with a massive legacy, right? We look at his legacy. It's absolutely incredible because he was a, it was a part of ending the transatlantic slave trade, right? Seeing the slave trade happening, and he saw this, he saw the injustice and said, we need to stop this. And do you know what he did? This made him angry? Because it says this, he he had heard reports of the horrific treating of black slaves on the slave ships and homes, and it appalled him. It appalled him, and his anger motivated him to a 20 year journey of blood, sweat, and tears to see the abolition of the slave trade. And his anger motivated him not to hurt people, but to heal people. His anger motivated him not to hate people, but to love people people what injustice is making you the most angry it might be in your home or it might be in your family it might be in your workplace what is it that makes you the most anger the most angry and then what is it motivating you to do what does your anger motivate you to do and you know i have to be very careful in my own life when it comes to anger i have to be extremely careful because anger has been a huge part of my story you know, anger has been a huge part of my story. And I was young. I used to have huge anger problems, right? You know, I remember a moment when I was in kindergarten and I was in, the, you know, the bathroom and some kid came and he, he had splashed me with, you know, his water. He just washed his hands, splashed me with the water. So I took him and I, I threw him against the wall, you know, because I was angry, right? And I've always had this thing, a part of me, where, where anger has been a part of my story. And I have to be extremely careful because my anger can motivate me to either do good things or bad things. And oftentimes anger motivates us to do bad things. And I used to have this huge anger problem. And and, and unfortunately in my life, there's just been so many moments where anger led me to hurt people rather than love people. So many moments that I can recall on or reflect on things that happen. And oftentimes anger, right, it starts so small. Right? It's just smart starts maybe with a little frustrated because my daughter just spilled her food and I'm trying to clean it up and, and it starts small and then it just escalates, right? As she gets frustrated, as I get frustrated, oftentimes this this anger kind of comes up. I can start getting really, really frustrated and really, really angry angry. And sometimes I respond to my daughter in the wrong way, maybe by raising my voice, and then it just makes things so much worse. I have to be extremely careful when it comes to uncontrolled anger in my life. Because anger that's uncontrolled, what that means is that we cannot control our response, right? How do you respond? What what does anger motivate you to do? We have to be able to control what it motivates us to because it will motivate you. Anger motivates you. But what is it leading you to? That is the really important question. What does anger lead you to? What does it motivate you to do? Because anger itself will not destroy your legacy, right? Anger will not destroy your legacy. In fact, anger can actually be what we build our incredible legacy on. That's what makes anger happy. Go and do it. But if you cannot control your anger, it will motivate you to destruction rather than building. What is anger motivating you to do? If you want to build Build a long lasting legacy. Let your anger motivate you to love and not lead you to hate. We see so many people lose their legacy based on how their anger led them to treat and hate people. Right? We see so many people. How many people that we look up to, maybe, maybe you as a leader, you look up to some of these people and then you see some of the things that they've left in their in their wake because of anger. We see this so frequently that people's legacy is so tainted due to the anger and what it motivated them to do. How can we learn to control our anger better? And I have three things that help me when it comes to anger in my life. And number one is this, is create space. Okay, so I can be very impulsive, all right? So I, I can be very impulsive, right? I got ADHD, so I just like sometimes see something, I'm like, I gotta do this and I go and do it. And So how I respond to anger is often very impulsive and I don't think about it. 
right? I just kind of see it happen. And I just respond right away, right? I, I just like, ah, right? And so I have to learn how to create space to actually have time to think. Because I make horrible decisions when I don't think properly. You know, when I'm angry, my mind is not thinking properly. And so I have to create space to learn how to maybe walk away from a situation, maybe walk away for a moment from a conversation, walk away from something just to take time. Okay, I need to breathe. I need to relax. I need to take a moment to, to think, to actually think about what it is that's happening around me. Create space in, your, in that moment to actually think. I remember one time, you know, we were doing youth again on Wednesday nights and we were doing youth. And I don't remember something before our, our group started, I got super angry. And, and I, I remember being like, I don't even know what to do. And I went to my wife. I said, Beth, hey, I'm going for a walk. You, you, you know, you get ready for youth. I'm going to go for a walk. And so I went out, I grabbed the coffee and I just took a moment to breathe. I took a moment to think. I took a moment to have more clarity because oftentimes when, my, when I'm angry, my mind is clouded and I'm not clear in my thinking. And so I took a moment to actually create clarity in my mind to think, okay, wh why is it that I'm angry and how should I respond to this? Because I would have responded in a very poor way. I don't even remember, right? I don't remember what was making me so angry that night. Oftentimes I think it's that things that make us angry are such so small and don't even really have any significance. But but I remember just having a moment to just breathe and I came back and I was able to make better decisions I was able to think clearer. I was able to respond in a healthier way You need to create space when things make you so angry Do you have a system or a practice or a way to actually create space? Maybe again, it's walking away or maybe it's you know heading out and doing something else just to get your mind Again thinking more clear. So number one create space number two is realize what causes you to be the most angry Right. What is it? in your life that causes you to be the most angry. And there's so many things, right, that can make us be angry. So many things. I just have a few that that, that, that that I've experienced in my life and maybe you have as well. But number one is when when I'm treated unfairly, I can get pretty angry, right? When somebody mistreats me or mistreats somebody that I love, I can get pretty angry about that. And then number two is when I when I feel powerless and I can't do anything about it, right? When someone mistreats me and I feel like I can't even do anything about it, that makes me angry. Number three, maybe uh, when, when we or the people that we love are being threatened, Right when there's somebody that we love that's being threatened, maybe it's at school or at work, whatever. We're like, I'm angry, right? I'm gonna protect the people that I love the most. And number, uh, this one is when our character, when your character is attacked or questioned, right? When somebody uh, questions your integrity or somebody questions my leadership or someone questions my heart or someone questions my love, like when that happens, I can get pretty angry. I'm like, do you, do you even know me? Do you know how much I care? Do you know how much I love? That can make me extremely anger, angry. And then the last one is. When we realize our failures and missteps, right? Oftentimes our anger actually is created because we didn't respond or we didn't do what we wish we would have. It makes us angry at ourselves for how we responded or the decision that we made or the choice that we made. It can make us extremely angry. What is it that causes you to be the most angry? We need to understand these things. You know, for me, what makes me oftentimes the most angry is when things beyond my control cause a disruption, <laughs> okay? So when some, when I have a plan, and I like to be prepared, I like to have a plan, I like to come into something knowing what's going to happen, I know I want to know what the outcome's going to be, I want to know who's going to be there, like I want to, I have all the questions, I know exactly what I want it to look like, and when it doesn't look like I want it to look, it can make me really angry, right? When a curveball comes in or something changes last minute, I can start to get pretty angry because I'm like, how could you not just give me this information now? Why didn't you give me this? This information, you know, yesterday or an hour ago or two weeks ago. Why am I just learning about this right now? Now I have to change my whole plan because I didn't know this was going to happen. It can make me extremely, extremely angry. So when something comes up that I can't predict or I can't expect, I feel powerless to change it. I'm like, I don't even know what to do now. So I get angry, which oftentimes makes things worse because my mind gets so cloudy. Clarity disappears and my mind is just so cloudy. I don't even, my mind doesn't even think straight anymore. So, so I forget to think and I forget to talk and I start responding to things out of anger rather than out of the calm or the preparation that I, I've had before. And once we understand, right, once we understand the deep root, once I understand, okay, when things come up that I can't control, it can make me angry, I have to be like, you know what, it's okay. It's okay if I didn't expect this to happen. It's okay if, if this, out, this, this came up and I didn't know it was going to come. It's okay, and I need to take a moment, create some space, and say, okay, 
I'm going to take a breather, then I'm going to come back, and we're going to go through this together. And so, so you have to understand the root of what makes you angry. What is it in a conversation with your spouse that's making you so angry? What is it in a conversation with your children that's making you so angry with your coworkers or with your boss or, or with, your, with your business partners? What is it that is making you so angry? And once we know that, then we can actually, there's, okay, what am I going to let this motivate me to do? Am I going to let this motivate me to say things I'm going to regret? Am I I'm going to let this motivate me to make poor decisions? Or I'm going to let this motivate me to just love my team better or to love my family better? Because that's what is most important. What does What causes anger? And then what are you going to do about it, right? And then number three is just ask for help. This is one of the hardest things to do when we're angry is to ask people to help us. Right, to ask people to sit with us, to ask people to be there with us. There's so many things in our lives that, that we struggle with. And our pride gets in the way of asking for help, at least for me. I can't speak for you, but for me, pride often gets in the way of asking for help because I think I can do it on my own. I'm tough enough. I'm strong enough. I'm smart enough. I'm creative enough. Right? I can come up with a solution by myself. That's where my mind goes. I get so prideful of asking for help, it might be time to ask somebody to help you when it comes to controlling your anger. Maybe it's asking someone to be there for you and tell you to go on a walk when things get tense. Somebody to be there for you and say, hey, I know you're angry. I know even there's things that are injustice that maybe are making you angry, but take a moment to breathe and go for a walk, right? Find somebody who can help you. Maybe it's asking your pastor or your friend to pray with you when it, when it comes to anger, saying, you know, I have a problem. I get angry with my kids, and I shouldn't, and it's over something so small. You know, spilled food, and I just get so mad. It's like asking your pastor or asking your spouse or asking somebody you trust, a friend, to pray for you and pray with you is really, really important. To, to, to share things with, with these trusted people, saying, you know, I'm realizing that this is what makes me so mad when there's so much injustice towards my family and then I respond with anger and I respond in the wrong way and it's causing things to get worse. Are you honest? Do you have somebody to be honest with and that you can trust to help you overcome you know, anger in your life? We all have people in our life. And, and I think we need to learn how to ask for help. And not just with anger, just in life. Do you have people, and we have people, are you asking people to help you when you desperately need it? Ask for help. Asking for help is one of the most courageous things we can do. Why? Because we're stepping on in vulnerability and saying, I struggle, right? I have a problem. I admit, I'm admitting I have a problem and I need you to help me. I need your support. I need you to, to keep me accountable. I need you to help me. I need you. That is one of the most courageous things we can do because it's admitting our weakness and allowing other people to come in and make us strong. You know, we have people in our life to help you be strong. Do not lose out or do not miss out on that support because of pride. And speaking of pride, you know, the second uh, thing that's a legacy killer, number two, is ongoing pride. Ongoing pride will destroy your legacy. Ongoing pride will destroy the best of relationships. Ongoing pride will destroy the best of business partners and business deals. Ongoing pride will de destroy your legacy. Ongoing pride. And it's interesting with pride is that pride is something that most people struggle with, but we do not admit it, right? We do not admit our pride. You know, I've been a pastor, you know, for several years, you know, eight years, and I've never once had somebody come to me and say, hey, I need you to pray for me because I'm very prideful, right? I've, I've never had that, right? Because we don't like to admit it. We don't like to admit that our struggle with pride. Same with anger. We don't like to admit our struggle with anger, but we don't like to admit our struggle with pride. You know, pride is something that we all struggle with. I think we really do. It's something that we all have a struggle with. And the question is, what is pride? Well, pride is finding our identity and our own achievements and basing our entire life on what we can accomplish and how we look at other people. You know, pride is using other people to build our own business. Pride is using other people to make ourselves better. Pride is looking at ourselves and saying, I'm better than you, so I'm going to take as much from you as I can, and then I'm going to find somebody else. And sometimes it comes out so subtly, right? When I look at my life, there's so many areas where I'm so prideful, so many areas that I need to work on. And, you know, C.S. Lewis, he's famously quoted as saying this, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it is thinking of yourself less. 
You know, humility or pride might sustain you for a short time, right? You might start building something amazing with pride. You might look at yourself, look what I've accomplished. Look at look at the, the money I have, the wealth I've built. Look at the business I have. Look at the car I have. Look at the house that I've built. Look at, look at me, right? Pride is saying, look at me. Look what I've accomplished. And humility is looking and saying, look at you. Look what you've accomplished, right? So we have to make that shift in our mind that the life and leadership and legacy is more about how we build up others more than how they build us, right? Ongoing pride will destroy your legacy. It will absolutely destroy your legacy. When you look around you, do you walk around in arrogance or modesty, right? Do you walk around saying, look at me, look what I've done, or do you walk around saying, look at you, look what you've done? That's different language, and we have to switch our language. You know, you might be talented. You might be successful. You might have influence. You might have the house. You might have the car. You might have it all. You might even be more talented or better than some people at other things. You might have it. But if we hold our talent, if we, hold, if we hold our intelligence over people, we are creating a hierarchy of people in our mind. <laughs> right? We're creating a hierarchy of people in our mind. Because what happens is when you create this hierarchy, one of two things. Number one is that we believe we are better than people. We believe we're more valuable than people. We believe our voice is more important than other people's. Or the opposite is we think we're less than other people, right? We think that, that, that we are less than them. We're less intelligent. We're less creative. We're less impactful. We have less influence. We have less wealth. And so when we look at that, we say, ah, you know, this is the hierarchy that we create in our minds when we walk in pride. We need to stop looking at other people as less than or better than us. We have to stop looking at other people as that their voice or their talent or their intelligence or their creativity is less important than the ones that we have. We need to shift from pride to humility, right? We have to switch from pride to humility. You are no better than anyone else. I am no better than you. You are no better than me. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all are. And so we're all broken people trying to make it, trying to go forward. We are not better than one another. We are not. And our relationships might fall apart because we're so focused on ourselves, so focused on what you offer me, so focused on what I can get from you. And sometimes we forget that a relationship takes two people. A relationship takes give and take, give and take. It's really hard when we're in a relationship where we're always the ones who are giving everything, right? We're giving, and the other person is just taking everything that we have. We need to learn how to be givers in relationships. We need to learn how to, to be givers of ourselves, of, of all that we are in relationship. Not takers, but givers. You know, the best relationships are those where there, there is a give and take, right? There's going to be moments where I don't have anything to give, and there's going to be moments where you have nothing to give. And we need to lean on each other so we can give and take when we need it. We need to learn to do that. And so I think sometimes our relationships right now, we're in overdraft, right? Because we have somebody that we've just been taking from, taking from, or somebody that's been taking from us, taking from us. We're starting to get into debt because we can't even build up our, our time. We can't build up our resources enough for how much somebody's taking from us. We need to learn how to, to, to stop living in overdraft, overdraft, stop living in debt when it comes to this, but actually living in a space where we're giving to, but we also have to receive. You have to be a receiver. You have to be a taker sometimes as well. You know, humility is learning when you have, when you have a need and asking for help. All right, we talked about ask for help in your life. Comparison will destroy you. You know, comparison will, will make you prideful, right? And prideful either I'm less than or better than you. Know, comparison leads to pride. And when we're constantly comparing ourselves to, to people, when we're constantly comparing our lives or our, our jobs or our ch families to other people, which we all do, we're all comparers. We're looking at people uh, in the eyes that they are better than me or that they, I'm better than them, right? We, we look at people comparison saying, you know, your job, you make less than me, so I'm better than you. You know, th th this is how we view things. Comparison is poison to relationships. We need to learn to celebrate people even if they are getting what we want. Even if they're, they got the promotion. Even if they got the healing. 
even if they got the, the spouse, even if they got the house, even if they got the car that we want, we need to start learning to celebrate them rather than compare and say, I wish I had that. I wish that that was my life. No, that's not your life. Live your life. Learn to celebrate people even if they're getting what you want. We need to be celebrators, not comparers. Comparison destroys human connection. It'll destroy your legacy. It causes us to be prideful because we say, look what I have. What I have is better than you or what I have is less than you. It doesn't matter what other people have. Use what you have. What you have matters. And how do we become more humble, right? How do we learn to stop comparing? How do we learn to be more humble and not be prideful? What are the things that we can do? And I have three things that will help us and help me when it comes to pride. And number one is we have to be grateful. One of the best ways to stop comparing and start to walk in humility is to look at what you have and be grateful for it. You need to realize that you are enough and what you have is enough. You are enough. What you have is enough. We have to write down what we are grateful for. You know, I'm pretty visionary in my thinking. I like to think into the future. I like to think about, you know, what's going to happen next. I like to think about, you know, where I'm going to be. I like to set goals. Like, I'm, pre I'm prepared. I, like, I like to look into the future. But oftentimes what happens is because I'm so focused on what's going to come, I forget to think about what's happening right now. I oftentimes let time just pass me by. I let moments just pass me by that I forget to live now, I think, you know, this is what I want in the future, which is amazing, right? Think about what you want. But are you actually grateful for what you have right now? Are you grateful for the things that you have in your life, for the place you live, for the job you have, for the food on your table? Are you grateful for what you already have? Don't miss out on what's happening right now. Don't miss out on the blessing today because you're so focused on the blessing that you want. What do you have? What are you grateful for right now? You might be praying for the promotion. You might be praying for the girlfriend. You might be hoping and expecting the miracle. You might be hoping or praying for the healing. You might be in that place. And I believe that, you know, God will provide. But I also know, be grateful for what you have right now. Somebody else might get the job that you want. Somebody else might get exactly what's your biggest desire. Somebody else might get that. And we need to be grateful because gratitude helps us stop being so s wishing we had something else. Gratitude kind of centralizes us and leaves us in a place where we say, okay, that's what I want. That's my desire. But look what I have right now. You know, the, you know we're living a life where the things that we have now, some things we were praying for five years ago. Right. You know, the things that you were praying for five years ago, some of us were living that today and we lose gratitude for it because they're like, ah, but there's so much more. I want next. I want the future. And it's like, no, be grateful for what you have right now, because we all have things to be grateful for. We all have something to be grateful for. So that's number one. Be grateful. Number two is be generous. Be generous. Put the needs of other people above your own. You know, you might have high influence, you might have high wealth, you might have built something so beautiful here on this planet. You may have done something so powerful with your life so far. You might have things that other people really need. Pride is taking what we can and humility is giving what we have. You know, what do you have to give? You know, we might have, we look around our world and we look around our families and our churches and our businesses. There's so much need right now, right? There's so many people in need. And some of us, we have the ability to meet some of those needs, to have the ability to meet people when it comes to giving them food, you know, whatever it looks like. Do, do you have time in your life to be generous? You know, generous will help us not be prideful because our constant thought is, okay, what can I give to you? What can I give not what can I get, not what can I, what do you, can you offer me, but what can I give to you? Generosity changes us from prideful to humble because our focus is on other people first. What do you need? You know, some of us, we built so much wealth or we built so much, you know, great relationships and our biggest fear is that we're going to lose it. Right? Our biggest fear is I'm going to lose my wealth, I'm going to lose my relationships. And so we're living in this fear constantly of losing that we don't have time to be generous, right? Because like, no, you can't take because what if I don't have enough? You know, what if I don't, what if I run out of time? What if my money disappears? But I think our fear should not be, what if we lose it? Our focus has to be, what if I give it? 
What if I give you some time? What if I give you some of my resource? What if I give it to you? That will help us stop being so prideful. Humility is grown by seeing value in other people. And building into it, right? Well, I see value in you, so I'm going to make you better. I'm going to build you up. They may offer you nothing. They might have nothing to give you, but we need to say, okay, that's fine. Because what can I give you? How can I make you better? How can I make you more valuable? Building into other people. That's what generosity is. Not just money. Not just time. It's building other people with what you have. It might be your knowledge. It might be, it might be teaching people the things that you have in your mind. We need to be generous if we want to learn how to stop being so prideful. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's about other people. And then the last thing that will help us when it comes to pride is this, is we have to learn to ask good questions. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and the whole conversation was about them, right? I'm telling you, you know, this is the wealth. This is my business. This is what God's doing in my life. This is, and you're like, I want to share some of what I'm doing, right? Like, I want you to ask me questions. And I've had to learn in my life. If I want to learn to be less prideful, I need to center conversations about other people and learn how to ask really important and great questions. We get around people who are constantly just bragging about themselves, right? Look what I've done. Look at my house. Look at the renovations. Look at my car. Look at what I've done, right? We get, I'll be honest, I get sick of conversations where it's all about you. Where, where I'm not asking you questions. You're just coming in and telling me everything that you are. You know, bragging is one thing that will destroy humility, right? Walking and saying, look what I have accomplished. Look at my family. Look at it all. We need to learn how to stop bragging. You know, bragging is not just talking about your accomplishments, right? Bragging is talking about them when no one's asking, right? You know what bragging is? Is when you're walking around telling people your entire, all the amazing things. Nobody's asking you, bro. No one's asking. I don't, like, do people even care? You know, we need to learn how to yeah, ask great questions, create space for other people to tell you the blessing, create space for other people to tell you what's happening in their life, what they're doing, the things that God's doing. Like, we need to learn to, how to ask good questions. Because success and accomplishments are not bad. Wealth is not bad. Influence is not bad. These are not bad things. But the whole world doesn't need to know. The whole world doesn't need to know your biggest accomplishment or your biggest success the whole world doesn't need to know asking good questions shifts the conversation from me to you asking great questions shifts the conversation from what i've done to what you've done we need to learn how to ask great questions in conversation you know i love questions i love learning people's story i love sharing my story when I'm in a conversation with someone, especially if it's a new person, I like to ask questions about the why the way that they are. Why is it that you do this? I love to understand why you respond like this, why you built this business. I want to know the why. I like to learn about you. I like to learn about your life. I like to, like to learn your habits. I like to learn your hobbies. I like to learn your values. I want to know you. It's not just about what, you, what your success is. It's about I want to know who you are. I want to know what makes you go, what makes you tick, what keeps you going. That's what I want to know. We have to learn to ask great questions because it shifts the conversations from us to them. Some of us were really good at answers. All right, we got all the answers. But sometimes we need to stop giving the answers and asking great questions. You know, what questions do you ask in the midst of a conversation to shift your focus from you to them? Ask great questions. It is so important. Important. Your story matters, right? And humble people will approach you and ask you about your story. Humble people will ask you about your story. You know, when we're so good at answers, it actually leads us to almost be has ah, a legacy killer, right? The pride, the ongoing pride is a legacy killer because we're so focused on ourselves that we're not actually adding value or actually having significance or actually bringing life change to other people because it's all about us. We need to stop walking in pride and start walking in humility. It is so important. Humility is caring deeply about people enough to ask questions. Enough to sit with them and let them share their story with you. Enough to sit with somebody who's struggling and letting them just share the things that they're struggling with. To share the things that they're going through. That's what humility is. Legacy is so important. 
Legacy is so important, and I think it's something we all think about. And the question that comes to legacy is what do I want to be remembered for? What is it that I want to be remembered for? Legacy killers are things that destroy your legacy and destroy your influence. The things that you don't want to be known for. There's a lot of things I do not want to be known for. The things that we don't want shared at our funeral. Those are legacy killers. Uncontrolled anger has the power to destroy the best of relationships and leave a sour taste in people's mouths towards you. Everything good you can you do can be tarnished in a moment of rage and ongoing pride is is thinking so highly of ourselves that we don't have time for the stories and the needs of other people people won't want to be around us if, if all we think about is ourselves if all we think about is how can you build me we're not going to have a lot of relationships at least good relationships pride comes before the fall let us build a, leg a lasting legacy filled with anger that motivates us to love and not hate. That motivates you to love and not hate and to care for people and love people and take care of people and not hurt people. A legacy that has humility at the forefront. Let us build a legacy that humility is what we are about, where people are our why, not our bank account, not our house. That people are the why we do this. People are the why we build our business. People are the why we have kids. People are the why. The why we build families. Why we build businesses. Why we build churches. Let Don't let you be your why. Let them be your why. It's not too late. It's never too late to change your trajectory. It's not too late to let go of anger. It's not too, le too late to let go of pride. It's not too late. It's never too late. We can build a lasting legacy, a legacy that doesn't die when I do, when you do, a legacy that doesn't die when we do, but carries on for generations. You can do it, and we can do it together. Thank you for joining us today for The Known Podcast. We have new content coming out every Wednesday, so make sure to come back next week for a new episode. If you haven't yet, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Known Podcast and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. See you next week.